This is the Obscurity to Authority podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. And we're live. How's it going, man? What's up, brother? Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to do it. I do a lot of podcasts. I do my own. I've been jumping on other ones, and it seems like it's a booming platform right now, dude. So I'm excited. It really is. Thank you so much for taking the time. What's the name of your podcast? Supreme Being. It's uh, on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, all that fun stuff. Nice. Hopefully some people go pop over there and check it out. Good stuff, man. Well, today I kind of want to go through a few of the experiences you had. You've been crushing it in the real estate world. Um, you've been crushing it as a YouTube influencer. What do you got now? 100 plus thousand subscribers? Uh, I think I'm at 117 now, something like that. Wow, that's crazy. And how long have you been doing the YouTube game for? Years, bro. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people think I'm an overnight sensation, but I've been uh, doing YouTube probably about four four years and I would say really pushing it a year and a half or two where I started really consistently, you know, working on it and uploading very, very good content on a regular basis. Wow. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Cool. So let's, let's talk about this. I mean, I want to know where you started. Now you're in real estate. Explain to me kind of where your business is now. What do you do on a day to day? Well, it's a little different now because I have a team. Right. So I push a lot of the day to day activities to them. I'm more of a CEO now than anything. And I've really opened the door to some of the other businesses that I've started, such as coaching, you know, selling products, traveling and speaking, and some of the other fun stuff that I'm doing. I do some real estate investing too, which I started a few years ago. Uh, So how I started five years ago is completely different to how life is right now. It's like been a complete just 180. So where did you start? Were you just born with success, money, and a big YouTube following? (laughs) No, man, I... From age 10 or 11, I would say I dedicated my life to basketball, and I played in high school, I played in college, I got a scholarship, I played professionally for three years, and after my second ankle surgery, I decided to stop playing because I lost that killer instinct, and uh, my ankle uh, just couldn't really hold up to the pressures and the day-to-day rigors of you know being a professional athlete because you live, breathe, eat basketball. So I just uh, I couldn't take it physically anymore, we can say. So I came back. I was about age 25, maybe a little bit more, uh, to the States. And for about a year, dude, I was kind of lost. Didn't know what to do, you know, kind of going back and forth, getting uh, confronted with the reality that I'm going to have to get, quote, like a normal job, right, Mm -hmm. and not live that dream anymore. And for a year, I was just kind of messing around, experimenting, looking at different things, and I just stumbled across a real estate office uh, that had one of those signs that said, make $100,000 your first year in real estate. <laughs> and I knew I knew probably only one guy ever did that. But I said, hey, you know what? Let me talk to that guy and find him and, and see if I can see if this is a real opportunity for me. So I went inside, and long story short, the broker was my first basketball coach ever when I was a kid. Wow. So, you know, times have like when I last saw him, I think I came up to his shoulders and now I was probably almost two heads taller than him because I hadn't seen him in such a long time. And, you know, we sat and we talked and I just right there, I saw the opportunity and I saw what I brought to the table as far as commitment, discipline, my grit, mastering fundamentals. And I said, man, I can get in this industry and just tear it up. And on the spot, I signed up and a year later, I got my license and boom, I was off to the races. Wow. That's crazy. What are the chances of that, eh? I know, dude. It it really was, uh, you know, and this is what I tell people. The important part of that is that year before I found real estate, I was out there interacting with the world and exploring. I wasn't sitting in my home watching people online or watching YouTube videos trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was out there talking to people, moving and shaking. My friend had a a mobile detailing business where he washed cars. I went with him for a couple days and I was like, eh, I'm not really feeling this. I went on job interviews. I was like, eh, I'm not feeling this. So I was actually out there. And I think that's what's missed with a lot of people is they think they can just sit at home Mm. and figure out, oh, this is what I want to do with my life. You got to get out there and try stuff, right? Experiment. And that was a good year that I did that before I chose real estate. And I think that process is what allowed me to see real estate for the opportunity that it really was. I like that because that seems to be a common theme among a lot of our guests. Like on our last episode, we had Pejman Gadimi from Secret Entourage, as I mentioned before we started recording. Um, and he was going on the exact same topic about this thing about finding your purpose because that's something I'm passionate about too. A lot of people, especially in, in my age demographic, they struggle with that. 
what's their purpose? Where do they go? They have really no direction. They're doing a job they hate. They don't know how to get out of it. And and Pedro said the same thing. He goes, you're not just going to wake up and know your purpose. You basically have to go out and just do shit until you figure out this thing that sticks, but you won't know. And he basically said, just be passionate about each thing you do for the sake of doing it, not because it's your life goal. But if you're going to wash cars, be passionate that day about washing the cars. And eventually it starts to build that confidence and you will find that thing that you're truly passionate about. Absolutely, man. I mean, uh, you have to grab uh, life by the horns. You know, I was taught that a long time ago, and I, I just think we live in the day and age of the phone, and everybody wants to hide behind it instead of actually getting out there and interacting and communicating with the world. And for the people who do take that step, obviously, we, we can see the difference right away. Yeah, no, I, I I definitely agree, because I think that's one of the biggest problems right now is people just not getting that. So what, what's your best advice? If someone is right now, let's say a student or starting their first job, and they're unhappy, like, do they quit and try something else? Do they like, what's your strategy for, for finding that, for getting out of that rut you're in and getting somewhere else? Well, the beauty is, especially if you're somebody who's in school, you can do internships and, and, and try different stuff out. You know, I've had a lot of people even just show up at my office and, and want to talk and I've taken the time to talk to them. You know, I get people emailing me all the time, but for the people who actually show up, I'll give them the time. I get hundreds of emails. Oh, can you mentor me? Can you help me with this and that? But the people who actually show up, even if it's unannounced, I'll give them 15, 20, 30 minutes of my time because I know that effort. And that was me when I started. And those people gave me the time because I actually showed up. So my advice to those people is whatever you want to explore and that you're open to, you have to do whatever it takes to get in front of those people or get those opportunities. And if it requires you doing an internship, uh, internship where you're not paid, right, that's OK, because I, I get so well, you know, are you going to pay me? It's like, dude. You want to learn from me and the people that I learned from, I didn't even think to ask them to pay right, me. Right. I just said, dude, if I can just sit in the room, I'm happy. So there's almost like this sense of entitlement now. Like, yes. oh, well, I can go to YouTube and get all this shit for free. It's like, come on, man. Give me a break. I just think people need to put their their own thoughts and misconceptions to the side and say, well, if I want to try this, I need to go to that person and do whatever it takes to get in front of them. If I have to go to their seminars – I'm going to go. Yep. If that means me coming out of pocket a couple hundred bucks for an opportunity to sit at the table with them, I'm going to do it because that's what I did. I did whatever it took. I started watching, uh, for the people who don't know, Mike Ferry. He's like the godfather of real estate coaching. Hmm. When I started, I went to his event literally the week that I got licensed. I, I pulled out a credit card and went to the event. Now, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. It's just what I did. right? And at that event, the first 10 rows is where all the top producing real estate agents are. Right. That's where they sit. They have a VIP section. In between every break, I would go up there and shake as many hands as I could and talk to as many people as I could. And you know, just looking to, to have lunch with them, which I had lunch with three people that was phenomenal. I was getting people to practice the dialogues with, the sales dialogues, you know, role playing and practicing. And I must have asked probably close to 100 people, man, to practice with me. And you know how many told me yes? Three. So yeah. three out of 100 people told me yes. Yeah. But those three that I practiced with every week took me to the next stratosphere as far as my skill level and my confidence in the business from the beginning. Yet I know so many people, bro, that if I tell them that story, they wouldn't just take it and go do it. They'll say, oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. Right. They yeah. won't implement like that. And that's what I did. And that moment changed my life for sure. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, I think, see, that's a big problem. People are not willing to do that. They're looking for that. What's the one quick thing I can do? What's the video I can watch? What's the, like I have people come, cause so my business now is, is marketing. So I have a marketing agency, right? And we'll sit with other entrepreneurs or just some people who know me and they want to build their first business. Um, and they'll ask for advice. I'm like, well, what do you think I should do for this Facebook ad campaign? I'm like, do you know anybody in your city yet? No. Have you met with anybody? No. Do you have coffee, drinks, dinner with anyone outside of your house or your friends? No. Well, instead of worrying about funnels and Facebook ads and posting crap, why don't you invite 10 people out on a Friday to grab coffee for 15 minutes? Do that every week every like for the whole month or repeat it month on month, whatever. Use LinkedIn to book those meetings. Use Instagram. Like I set up, like I've set up meetings with people from Dragon's Den on Instagram. Like you'd be so surprised if you just reach out in the right way, people will respond yeah. and you make it worth their time and you, you try to give back value. And a lot of times if you come from the frame of like, you know, I'm a young professional, whether it's in real estate or a young entrepreneur or a young business owner, um, and I really admire what you do. I'd love to have 10 minutes of your time. Coffee's on me. Lunch is on me. I, I know it would mean a ton to me. I know you don't get anything out of it, but it would mean a lot. You'll email 100 people and two or three will probably get back to you, right? But no one wants to do that. Absolutely, man. And even this with the podcast – yeah. I know people's perception would be, well, you have followers. Everyone's asking you every day. 
I get asked to do this regularly, yeah. but not nearly as regularly as people think. Like right. I'm doing this one, I'm doing one on Saturday, mm-hmm. and I've had maybe a handful of you guys reach out to me in the last couple of weeks. Right. And I get again dozens a day of, oh, can I have this for free? Can I come <laughs> talk to you? Like, oh, the... so people have such a misconception, and when you actually do it, like even one of the best pieces of advice I got in real estate. A lot of people are looking to work with developers in real estate because right. that's where a lot of money's at, right? They'll give you a building. They'll give you, you know, 20, 100, 200 units for you to sell like we see on TV. And the way I started working with my first developer was going on site. I was driving by and usually they'll fence it off and they'll leave a sign with the number. Mm. Oh, this is JJ Developers, number, you know, 555-5555. And I called and I had a conversation with the guy. We set up a meeting and he ended up hiring me to sell one of his new developments. Yet, if I asked a million realtors, would you call? What's the first response? Oh, no, for sure. They're good. They have people. They're not just going (laughs) to, if I call them, they're not going to answer. They're not going to take me serious. So literally the most simple thing you can do, which is just taking the action, like we've already been talking about this first couple of minutes, is Mm -hmm. literally what you have to do. And I I think people are just going to continuously create that story and never really take that step. They overthink to justify the laziness or the fear. Like re- really they're just they're just scared. They don't want to pick up the phone call. They don't want to get rejected. They don't want to go through that process. So they make up a story about how it would be impossible anyway and then it's easy to just say that's why I can't do it. Absolutely, bro. It, it's sad because it's such a simple thing. Yeah. And uh one tip I would give to people if maybe you're kind of on the fence about that or you are struggling to take action, just spend time, 10 minutes around somebody who doesn't have that block and just observe how they move mm. and and you'll see then you'll really see the light on how simple it is and it'll be easier for you to step back into your world and do it. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. That's good advice because, I mean, a lot of times they just don't have that frame of reference. They don't know what it should look like, what it should feel like. It's just whatever they've come up in their head. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be you know, degrading. I'm going to feel shit about it. But then you see a guy pick up the phone and just make 100 calls and they don't even feel it. Like I think it was you. Was it you who screenshotted something the other day about your number of calls in a day? It was like 1,000 or something. Yeah, yeah. Somebody That's else crazy. screenshotted it and, and put like savage or something. And oh my god! The, the funny part is, I know people who are coming up who won't do one tenth of that effort. Yeah. But then will complain that they're not getting results. And I'm like, dude, between me and my team, what you do in a month, we do that in a day or two. Yeah. Yet you're complaining that you're not getting any progress. Like it, it just doesn't make any sense. But it comes down to that frame of reference. Now people can see. Right. Oh shit! Damn. He's already there, and that effort is still there. Damn. That's more effort than me, and I'm still coming up. That really is what gets people to wake up and say, oh, shit, I need to take a look at my reality and make the proper adjustments if I really have that end goal that big. Crazy, man. So another big interest of mine, because obviously I'm in the social media space. We run social media marketing for a bunch of different brands. Um, I'm really interested also in what you've done with YouTube because that's not easy. You went from zero to what you said, 117,000 subscribers. Let's talk about that process. Like, How did that start? What, what got you into YouTube? I want to go right from the beginning. Well, uh, two things got me into YouTube, man. When I started in real estate, uh, you know, and I started looking at videos 2012 until I got licensed in about August of 2013, there wasn't much on YouTube. YouTube was not anywhere near what it is now. We didn't have everybody trying to be a YouTuber. You know, I go uh, around LA now and everybody's on their phone making a video or trying to vlog, right? Everybody's a vlogger now. So when I started, I found that there was nobody we can say in the millennial age group, especially in real estate and that niche making content. And number two, it was very difficult for me to find answers for what I was looking for. I could find stuff here and there from people who made videos, but I felt like those two things were missing the information necessary and also somebody I could relate to, right? That's what lit off the light bulb in my mind. And it came from the position of just, I'm going to document what I'm doing. I'm not Mm. an expert yet. I'm not, the, the number one guy. So what can I do on video? Well, I can document what I'm doing. And literally, that's all I did. And that's a quick point for people who, because I get the question a lot. Well, how do I start making videos? I'm not an expert yet. It doesn't matter. Document the journey. Document what you're doing. There's always people out there that are willing to watch and that will gravitate towards what you do in your message. right? So I started doing that. And then I just started sharing, hey, I'm reading this book. I went through this situation that tested me a little bit emotionally. But what I learned from this book helped me out. Check this book out. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, today I went door knocking. I hit 100 doors. This is my result. Hey, here's a live call. I'm going to post it. Boom. And people love that, right? All my live calls have at least like 100,000 views or more on YouTube because 
people love the drama of it. Like, oh, what is he going to say? Is he going to have an answer? Yeah, oh, did he yeah. close them? Right? All, all that drama. So yeah. that's all I did, man, for the first two years. And it took me, I think it took me two years, bro, to get like a thousand subscribers. Wow. And I wasn't doing videos every day, but I was doing at least one a week, sometimes wow. two. So it started as one a week for the first year or two. Then once I started getting a little bit of momentum, then I started, you know, the more regularity of the uploads. But in the beginning, it was just one a week. Uh, I'm doing a few Facebook posts, a few Instagram posts, but it started off slowly and me just documenting the journey and the come up. Interesting. And that's great advice because I say the same thing to people. Like I got to start taking my social media serious because we're in this weird spot where we're an agency. We work with a bunch of different businesses. Some of them are larger brands and we're so busy doing everyone else's stuff and video production work that like you just, by the end of it, you don't want to come back and do your own. But I, I've started now. Like I started Instagram is one of my favorites. So I started really pushing Instagram and went from like a few hundred to a couple thousand in the last like month and a bit. Um, but I think the biggest thing that people got to take away from what you just said was that one, it takes time. Because I think everyone's expecting they're going to get to 100,000 followers in three months or six months, and it just doesn't happen. And the other thing is documenting. A lot of people say, well, what do I create? Like, it's so much work. I got to think about it. We got to plan it. We got to document. Like, whatever you're doing in your daily life or your work, document. And then they say, well, there's nothing that interesting that happens. Well, one, there is. You just don't realize it. And two, then that's a problem. Maybe you're not doing enough shit in your day to day, (laughs) and you need to really spice up your level of activity, make more calls, go to more meetings, do more. Like have more action in general. Maybe that's a sign. But I think documenting is is key because that's easy. Like when we have meetings or certain client meetings or consultations, we'll just film it, right? Because it's interesting. Even say, I've done sales calls before, and we'll put that out, right? Because I know like, I used to go watch Grant Cardone. I used to like all day YouTube Grant Cardone cold call. <laughs> what does Grant Cardone do on the phone? Because <laughs> I used to be obsessed with that, right? Because it is like you said, it's a drama. So and that's easy content to make. So I think that's a great point. One is it's going to take time, and two, you got to document, right? Absolutely, man. And you made a great point. A lot of people, they don't do anything. So what are they going to document? So it's like reality check for them too. (laughs) Now, to me, what I was doing seems so regular in my world that when other people started reacting like, whoa, man, you're you're knocking on 100 doors a day. You're making 200 calls and you're practicing your scripts like two hours a day. Whoa, that's crazy. We do, you know, 10 phone calls a day. You're doing 200. It wasn't until... I saw the outside world's reactions that I kind of figured out in my mind, okay, well, what I'm doing is not normal. That's just Mm. how I train myself and my mentality. So I wasn't paying attention to what other people were doing. So in my world, that was, hey, that's what you do. And if you don't do that, my my mentality was like, what's wrong with you? Like I I thought literally other people had something wrong with them. I was like, you're new like me. You have no results. We both have no money, but we have big goals. Why would you not fight tooth and nail Mm. for your dream? That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And I saw the opportunity in video early on, but at about that two-year mark, when I realized, hey, what I'm doing is like that 1% effort, just that, not even the results or anything else, but just the effort, I'm onto something here and I really need to use this more, document this more, and really you know, share with the world more. And that's when I started collaborating more with some other people, and really taking off with it was I finally had that moment, that epiphany where I was like, whoa, okay, what I'm doing is not normal. This is extraordinary to the average person out there. Right. Let, let's let share it more. Right. And you said a very important word there, which is collaborate with other people because I think that's an important part. I don't think you can grow a large following on any platform without collaboration and leveraging others who are quite a ways ahead of you. What do you think about that? Absolutely, bro. And the <clears> one <throat> thing that I would attribute that to is not just collaborations, is one thing that's different about me with my social media, especially if you compare it to other people who are in the real estate space, I give a lot of my personal beliefs and philosophies in my life. I don't just talk about getting listings and selling. You hardly see that on my profiles. Mm-hmm. I share who I am, what I'm about, and what I love. I love cars, right? I'm friends with a lot of dating coaches, so I have a lot of that stuff, right? I love speaking my mind and, and teaching now, so that's always on my social media. And I've collabed with people from different genres. That is what I believe has been one of the biggest Mm. spurts of growth and opportunities for me to open up who I am and my brand to other audiences. And I think that's where people, they hit that choke point or choking point in their growth is, well, I'm a realtor. I can only collaborate with other real estate agents or business people because 
if I talk to this tattooed guy, then they're going to think I'm bad and, you know, <laughs> I associate with people from prison and yeah. all this stuff comes yeah. right now. We can talk about that stuff all day because, you know, there's a lot of limiting beliefs that I don't have that other people have. Like, I'm not afraid to break barriers. Right. Like, for people who maybe aren't familiar, I interviewed pretty recently on my channel a uh, big Herc. He runs a, a 450,000 subscriber YouTube channel. He's an ex convict. He was in wow. federal prison here in America for over 10 years. Now he's a multimillionaire hmm. and he's almost like a, a positive uh, role model and speaker for people who are coming out of the system wow. and want to better their lives. And when I made that interview, whoa, what the heck? Like, why are you, you know, collaborating with him and this and that? <laughs> but in my mind, I was like, because I would sit down and talk with Big Herc off camera. Yeah. So why would I not put that on my channel? Right. right. Same thing with all the car stuff. I've collaborated with a lot of guys who have huge YouTube followings in the car scene, but I love cars. Yeah. I'm not doing it for the videos. If the camera's not off, I have six cars in my house, and I'm out there wheeling and dealing all the time, banging gears, having fun. Yeah. I modify my cars too. So that's the the world that I introduced into the space that I think allowed me to have the biggest impact, growth, and attraction, we can say, because I'm not afraid to piss a few people off or offend them by bringing in other stuff. Because it's me and who I am. And, and this is how I'll wrap it up and I'll pass it back to mm -hmm. you, man. I told myself in the world, the moment YouTube and social media becomes not fun for me, I'm going to stop doing it. Hmm. This is how I keep it fun, fresh, and interesting. And this is why. As I continue year after year, so many people are falling off, getting inconsistent, and they're out of it. Because I make it fun. To them, it's a job and a chore. To me, I'm living life and expressing myself. That's right, it. Right. And I think that that's probably a big reason behind your success. I mean, you tell the real story of you. You don't manufacture a small window that you think is related to your industry. You bring the whole person. And I think that's what I, I haven't seen a successful YouTuber that's not doing that because I think as people, we want to engage with another person. And it, it's, it's not normal. Like if you meet someone on the street, if you make a friend, you never make a friend and just know that one part of their life. You kind of yeah. get to know all the areas. You like them for all the things they do, right? And on YouTube, when you try to filter that and just say, hey, I, I'm a real estate agent, so I'm just going to talk about real estate-related topics all the time, <laughs> then you're not really giving the full you. And if you're not giving the full you, no one can really ever connect, right? So I, I think that's a huge part of your success. Absolutely, bro. And uh, you know, a lot, a lot of it has to do with people being afraid. You know, uh, People don't want to show off their insecurities and all that other stuff. And that's a lot of like the confidence and inner game work that you know I teach people and I'm always preaching to people. But it, it is because at the end of the day, if we see a persona on screen, on TV or on YouTube, and they're playing that, that role that we think they should play, what are all of us saying? Ah, he's not like that. Oh, that's right. just for show. That's his TV person. So we know deep down inside intrinsically that that's not who they are. <laughs> so when you do see somebody yeah. on the screen – who, as they say, is, quote, keeping it real or at least at the, at, at the very core being authentic, it's like, okay, now whether I like this person or not, like their style or not, I can respect the fact that they're being themselves and they're expressing themselves because I've collaborated and come across a lot of people who don't like my style, especially in my industry. I have a ton of other real estate agents and people who do not like me. However, the ones who are affluent, the ones who are influential and who have followings and who have success, they're – the people who say, you know what, I don't like Brian's style personally because of how he is. However, I respect him and he's skilled at what he does. I get that level of respect and professionalism from them. Hmm. The only people who go outright and attack me are always the people coming from below me. Yeah. And yeah. that's the key that people need to understand when it comes to criticism and hate. If your colleagues, high-level colleagues, maybe don't like your style but they respect what you do, then you're doing it right. Hmm. That's the indicator to me that I'm doing it right. And I live at peace because I'm not hiding anything from anybody. Right. I'm being honest about everything. So I'm not worried about people finding out stuff or, okay, I told, I told you this lie. Oh, I have to tell somebody else, wait, what was my story? And people get caught up in that game. Yeah. I never wanted to get caught up in that. I would rather people just say, I don't like you than me lying and scheming and pretending right. to be somebody that I'm not. You know what I mean? Because right. it's, it's more peace of mind for you and it gives you more power as an individual because you can stand on whatever you say and your beliefs and your philosophies and your brand and say, bring it on because I'm standing on concrete. I'm not standing on quicksand. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. That's a hundred percent. So you, you've used all these strategies. You've attacked YouTube. You've grown this page. What's been the impact? Was it worth it? Does it have an actual tangible business impact? Like what's been happening? 
man, it's, you know, uh, I can say now, years ago, I, I did not think it would be to where it's at now. You know, mm-hmm. I even think of about a year ago, I started my, uh, my coaching program that I opened up to everybody, even outside of real estate called Modern Success. Um, the first couple months, I was like, whatever, I'm just starting it. And about four or five months ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to blow this thing out of the water. I'm just going to explode it. I had 40 members at the time, and now we have almost 300. Wow. Yeah, and it's it's a monthly subscription that everybody yeah. pays. You know, We do weekly calls and that kind of stuff. But just that focus and intention, because I made a shift about a year ago where I said, you know what? A lot of people need help, and apparently people want to come to me for help, advice on money, real estate sales, whatever, you know, uh, sex and dating, whatever it yeah. is. Cool. You know what? I'll, if people want it and they see the value in me, I'm going to start giving more. So my podcast, I do two episodes a week, and I really just started upping my game when it came to that because I realized, hey, I do enjoy this because it's making a bigger impact than I thought. So we have that. I have the products that I sell. I'm doing about two uh, speeches a month now where I'm being paid, like actually yep. flown out somewhere and paid a uh, speaking fee. Um, I mean I'm collaborating with uh, Mike Wolf, who's the guy who taught me and helped me with my first four real estate investments. So we're working together now. I mean it, it's just – uh, it's crazy. I'm really connected in the car world. I'm very connected with, you know, even the close integral people that are the the main people when it comes to the car parts of like Fast and Furious. Wow. Like those people from the actual movie industry. I'm yeah. connected with them now because I made a video of going to the Fast and Furious house on my YouTube and I got like 1.2 million right. views I saw that. and people saw it. So it, it, it's really like it, it, it's opened up like Pandora's box, we can say, yeah. where it's like, whoa, like what is this? I never expected this. And I've met a lot of great people, man. I've met a lot of beautiful people, and it's just I, – I think that it's such a beautiful platform, whatever it is, whether it's YouTube, you know, the podcast, to be a voice to help people because me coming up, I never had that until I hit my first mentorship at my first real estate office, and then I started finding some of the my mentors now and friends. I didn't have those figures that taught me how to be unbreakable, how to have more confidence, how to be a better speaker, how to make money. You know, money's not evil, right? You can be a millionaire. You can own a Lamborghini and all that other stuff. I never had that yeah. until age 27 and a half. You yeah. know, I'll be 33 this year. So for me to get a message from a kid who's 16 or 17 listening to me, I'm like, dude, what a blessing for you because you're hearing the stuff that I'm giving you that I was never taught until I was over 10 years older than you are now. Yeah. So use it to your full advantage. And it, it, overall, man, I just think it, it, it's awesome. I want to talk about that because you said something there about money. And I think that's something that I think about a lot, which is like, where do you think that comes from, this negativity around money? Why do people have that? Well, the majority of the world isn't in abundance when it comes to finances. And if you really play the, the tape back to our youth, most of us were brought up in lower income families like I was. Most of my family is from South America. Most of them are factory workers. Most of them live day to day with the funds that they earn and their wages. So now you're being taught lessons about money and a way of life from a perspective of not having enough, always being nervous about paying bills, not having enough money to put food on the table. So you're grown up and bred in scarcity. So now even the thought of money petrifies you Hmm. and it's conditioning, social conditioning. How many of us can raise our hand and say, oh, man, I had a multimillionaire uncle school me on money and, and the game of <laughs> entrepreneurship when I was coming up? Robert Kiyosaki. <laughs> right? So you know, even if you picked up that book at high school, let's yeah. say you were younger and you're like, you know what? I'm going to start reading, which I never did. I didn't start reading again until 27, 28 was when I started all this. Then even then you would have had 14, 15, 16, 17 years of a certain conditioning that now you read a book and you're like, whoa, wait, everything I was taught was wrong. Your immediate instinct is going to say, ah, this person in the book is full of shit. Right. No way. Right. No way. Because then you go back to the family life in your world, quote, and you're like, wait, so this guy in the book is saying the opposite of what everybody else is saying. Is this true? Mm. Now that's changed a bit because you can go on YouTube and see us and a bunch of other people yeah, yeah. living in abundance and preaching something else. So – it's social conditioning. However, it comes down, and this is something I preach to people all the time, you are 100% responsible for the results or lack thereof in your life. If you have a certain belief system and philosophy around money that you don't like and you're not living the life that you want, it's up to you to do whatever it takes to change it, and you have to be sick of it, and you have to make the change. So when you get that question of, oh, what's the one thing, 
I tell people it's a decision to make the change because once you decide, then you'll figure it out. I think uh, Anthony Robbins calls it resourcefulness. You yeah. don't lack resources. You lack resourcefulness, yeah, meaning yeah. if you want that answer or you want to get to that person, you'll leave no stone unturned and you'll do whatever it takes to get in front of them or make that change in your belief or philosophy. People just don't want it bad enough. It's cool to say it. Oh, yeah, man. You know, I'm doing self-help. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm studying this millionaire. I'm following this dude. I'm on his program. Yeah. It's become cool to brag about it instead of when I come up to them, I'm like, great, that's all fine and dandy. What are your results? Yeah, yeah. And then that's when I get the blank stares and there's no result. Yeah. You have to want it so bad that you'll go for the result, not just be happy that you're learning. Yeah, because see, a lot of there's a big problem in even the coaching industry or the online education industry, people selling courses where like if you if you ever try to sell online courses, I think you have some. I don't know how yours works, but ninety percent of the people we've done work for is is the funniest thing. They'll sell, let's say, a thousand spots in a course, and there literally will be like six hundred people that don't even log in once. They just don't show up. They pay the money, and this is across different industries you worked in. They pay the money, they get the account, they get all hyped up, they tell their friends they bought this program, and they never even log into it. And it's it's the same thing anywhere in self help. Anytime you go to like even a conference, like I was at GrowthCon uh, last year in Vegas, there's ten thousand yeah. people, all these great speakers dropping all kinds of knowledge, right? I looked around me. I was the only person I could see in my row because they had given notebooks to every guest, right? I was the only person in, in the row in front of me, my row and the row behind me. I had a notebook open that was actually writing things down. <laughs> like, here's the things yeah. I want to implement. Everyone else was just sitting there taking selfies and like, hey, I'm at growth. Well, how are you going to remember this tomorrow? Obviously, you're not going to implement it, right? They just, they're buying the feeling. They're buying the feeling of self-development. Like, hey, I spent this money. I bought this course. Awesome. But they don't do it. That's the problem. They treat it like going to the movies. Mm -hmm. they, they pay for an experience, mm -hmm. which is which is dandy. You are yeah. paying for that. However, you have to understand that what's at stake here, what's at stake here is your livelihood, your future. And people, they lack that sense of urgency. And because every other area of life, you're paying to go to Disneyland or paying to go to the movies and you just mindlessly yeah. get entertained and you're not engaged consciously, people just – they, they've disconnected that and the, the conscious effort now of, of, of improvement and progress is, is still lacking. It's, it's become this, I just need to be entertained. Yeah. And, you know, if, if I can add one thing to everybody who teaches or who listens to this podcast, one of the reasons that I've been able to grow the way that I grow is although I teach and inform and educate people, I entertain at the same time. Mm. And that's the key. That's how I can hold people's attention for 30 minutes or an yeah. hour on a call or whatever it is, is you have to entertain, educate, inform, entertain. Yep. If you cannot entertain, you will be broke and no one will be buying your shit, period. Yeah. 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 That's a hundred percent spot on because pe that's how people respond. Like that's, that's how we like, no one's going to spend time anymore on anything. That's not making them smile, laugh or cry. If they're not getting something out of that, it's impossible because if you just sat, like you probably have a ton of great knowledge. If you just sat down and gave, that clean wisdom. Here's all the secrets to life. I'm going to sit here and just tell you about that. <laughs> nobody, nobody would listen, right? But if you nope. do something, if you get your Lamborghini out and you go rip around the corner and you go meet with a guy with tattoos and you guys grab dinner and you're, you're, you're going back and forth, I'm watching now. It's a TV show. I need a TV show, right? 100%. Absolutely, bro. Absolutely, bro. And uh, as sad as that is, you know, it's just, I, this is what I tell people. Uh, don't hate the player, hate the game, right? Yeah. The game, the game of life is built where me and you and everybody else with common sense understands what we just said. Yeah. So now it's our responsi our responsibility to move the pieces on the chessboard. Yeah. I'm not going to be a piece. I'm going to be the mover of a piece. Yeah. So you have to use that information that you know to your advantage and say, okay, this is the way the game is played. I'm in the game whether I want to be in it or not because we're all living this life. How can I move my pieces in a sequence that allows me to win? Period. Right. Right. That's it. Right. And so there's two people in life. There's people like you just mentioned, like us that are aware of this. We, we know there's the system. They know, we know there's these certain things we have to do to get ahead. We know we have to take action and we know we have to move towards our goals. And there's people who are completely unaware. I think they're just, they're in a bubble. They're doing, and I said this yesterday in another interview, but I, I know someone very close who basically wakes up. They do their day job. They hate their day job. They come home at four o'clock. They literally turn on Netflix at about four 30 in their bedroom and they stay there till about 10 30 when they fall asleep then they repeat it then friday comes and they go out and they party and drink all night they go out all weekend it's just consume 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 and i'm thinking to myself like where do you expect this is about to end up like are they the best part is they still live at home and they're like 30 plus years old and they're doing this and i'm, and I'm just going like 
and I, this is not uncommon, at least around me, like around Toronto and the area. Like this is what, what a lot of the, this generation is doing. And I think to myself, like they can't knowingly know that they're doing something wrong or know what we know and ignore it. They must truly just not be aware. So to me, it's like it's an awakening. Like we went from where we were to where we are because we had some sort of awakening. We're like, oh shit, this is the real game. We get it now. But a lot of people have not had that awakening. So how do we help people like that understand that? Hey, you're you're not seeing the full view. This is going to kind of destroy you. How how do we get them to have that awakening? Well, th- th- this is my take on that, man. I would say there is a portion of people who maybe are not aware. Mm. However, I would say there's a disproportionately bigger piece mm. that know, but deep down inside they're okay with it, and that's the issue. They'll, they'll, they'll on the surface level they'll bitch and complain, mm. but deep down inside it's okay. It's not bad enough or there isn't enough reason to change that, like we were mentioning earlier, that's the justification for their misery. Right. Well, you know, I was just handed this life. Well, you know, like I would like to do it, but oh, it's so hard and I don't know what to do. What's the first step? What's one thing I can do? All the stupid shit we hear all the time. Yeah. So I think more often than not, more of those people are, are happy deep down inside with their misery and it's not bad enough for them to make a change because all of us who have made a change got to the point where we said fuck this yeah like i can't do this shit anymore yeah that that's how it happened with me because when i came back from playing basketball i was feeling sorry for myself like fuck this these stupid ass injuries i could have probably been in the nba this is crap and then i got to one day i was like what the fuck i'm 25 years old and I'm crying about life like I'm a 70-year-old man on his deathbed. Like how pathetic is this? I need to stop being a little bitch. Yeah, yeah. They haven't had that moment yet because if you would have asked me then, I, I, I would have told you too, well, this is just the way life is. I would have acted as if I didn't know mm. when we do know. Do and I know. think a lot of people just for their own ego and their own insecurities and all that, they will not admit it. So to the few people who maybe don't know – um. You know, th- that that's a tough thing because it's yeah. like you watch the movie The Matrix and the people that are walking around yeah. in the street, they're not even aware of The Matrix. Yeah. And even if they see Morpheus flying around, they're going to be like, oh, uh, OK. Like they'll be like, oh, you know, it, it was a Photoshop. You know, it was a YouTube video. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was an anomaly. Yeah. So they, they won't even want to believe it. So, I mean, for those people, man, uh, I would say, you know, maybe they will have that one moment where they will have an awakening. But for most people, I think mm. probably over ninety percent, bro, even more. It's you have to you have to really just be honest with yourself and say I'm okay with this. And I, when I tell that to people, man, I could see that they give me two looks. Mm. They're super pissed off that I called them out, but I also see in their mm. eyes they're like, this motherfucker knows. Yes. He knows the deep down secret that I'm trying to hide. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and that's really what it's about is you have to be honest with yourself and say that's it. I've had it and I'm going to make a change. And it's as simple as that. So they're happy in their misery because their misery gives them purpose, but it doesn't hurt enough to make them change. Well, look at, look at this too. Here's a good example. I'm sure you know, or you've heard of people who have their little clicks, three, four, five, six people. And all they do is complain about the negative shit going on in their life, the newest drama. And it's a constant cycle why is it is it coincidence that bad shit keeps happening to those people when they're stuck in that cycle? Right. Yet if you talk to them, right, they, they won't claim that they don't know. They'll just be like, "Oh, well, it's just the way life is, and I was dealt a you know the wrong cards and blah blah blah." But then again, they're complaining again, so it's a cycle that they've created. They're okay with. That's why I say they they enjoy their misery. They're happy with their misery. So true. It's so true. Because, I mean, if you look at it, though, I I can kind of understand why. Because if they pull away that misery and they pull away the drama and they pull away the complaining, what's left? That's the problem. What's left? That That's the fear. So how do – okay. So let's say for those that do know, right? They know. They want to make a change. Um, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They say, hey, I'm going to make a difference. I'm, I'm searching to make a difference. Where do they start? Do they read books? Do they get into coaching programs like one of yours? What do they do? Well, I think more than anything, uh, what I talked about earlier, getting around people who, for example, right, let's say somebody's listening to this and they're vibing with what we're saying. I'm sure every single person listening to this or who will listen to the recording, as we're speaking, one, two, three, or four people come to mind of what we're describing and what we are living. I would say those one, two, three, or four individuals, you need to do whatever it takes to get around them. You need to study them, 
But more than anything, you need to get in front of them. Mm. So if that means the coffee, like you were saying, hey, yeah. let's meet for 10 minutes, go to an event of theirs, a free event, go to a seminar, even if you have to pay, just get around them. Because even if you're going to learn from them, learning from somebody in person versus video or a course is completely different. Yeah. And when you get to see that person, how they move, how they talk, how they hold eye contact with you, how they shake your hand, how they express themselves, the way they carry themselves in the whole package, this begins the unlocking process. Mm. Because having some sort of imaginatory uh, you know, mental image about how it's supposed to be or what you think it's supposed to be is great. But when you finally experience it in person, that's what starts getting all the, the neurons firing off and starts this wave of change because you now have that frame of reference, like you were saying earlier, to know, oh, that's what it is. Now you've pinpointed it. Now you know what's possible. Mm. Now you've created that, we can say, stairway to say, okay, this is where I want to go. Right, right. I love that because, I mean, there's two – like for me personally – I have two ways of going about it. it. When possible, especially with, with some of the bigger players, I, I buy my access. Like I buy my way in, <laughs> whether that's their, their coaching, like Craig Ballantyne, for example, uh, is a guy who's helped me a lot. And I just bought my way in. He's a coaching program. It's $7,000 for the day. I did it. Worth it because he's so well connected now that we have a relationship. He's introduced me to other people. He never would have given that time or that level of experience if I wasn't bought. Because why would he give up his valuable time for someone just DMing him for help, right? It makes no sense. But when you show up and you commit and you say, hey, I'm, I'm here. I paid for it there's, hey, I'll, I'll return the favor. Because I find most successful people want to help other people, but they don't want to waste their time helping people that won't respond or take action, right? You don't want to blow it. So, But how do you, if you don't have any money, like if you can't do that, um, your only, the next best option is, like I said, trying to get people up for coffee, trying to get some of their time. Let's try to kind of come up here with a strategy or what's your strategy of, you know, I'm young or I, I just had this kind of awakening. I want to get around people. I want to improve, you know, the people in my proximity. Well, how do I reach out and make it worth it? How do I get them to care or meet with me? Like, how do you go about it? Yeah, two things, man. And what you said is absolutely true because for the people who even at times have bought one thing from me that cost a hundred bucks, I'll a lot of times bend over backwards yeah. to, you know, even exceed their expectations. Yeah. Oh, you know, I want to buy another product. You know what, dude, here, take this one for free. Yeah, yeah, Whoa, yeah. they'll join my coaching program. I'll jump on a call with them for 30 minutes or an hour because they're having an issue with something, Yeah. right? So you're totally right. Um, or an experience. I've had two or three people from my coaching program actually come to my house and spend time with me, mm. right? And I wouldn't do that for an average person That's DMing cool. me on Instagram, yeah. you know? So you're absolutely right about that. But number two, one thing I would say is if you have no money, there. I don't know – if they have this in Canada, but they have, uh, I think it's like meetup.com or yep. they have meetup they groups do. here. Yep. I'm sure they have it yep. there too. Same thing. That's the quickest, easiest, free way for you to get around people who are interested in the same thing that you are or want to mastermind about certain topics. You said it earlier. You have to have conversations with people and interact with the world. Yep. That's the easiest way to do this because then when you start getting around people who maybe aren't even top tier level, but they're at least at the level that you're at where they're exploring and they want to make a difference – there's power in numbers, right? Right. Compare one lion versus a pack of 10 of them, mm. right? One might not be able to take down a giraffe. 10 yeah. of them will eat the giraffe alive in yeah. 10 seconds, okay? Yeah. So this is what you need to understand is even if you don't have money, do the meetup thing. Yeah. Meet up with some people. Get around some people. Shit, go out and talk to strangers every day, which I did my first two years. You know, I, I mentioned a lot of my friends were are dating coaches. Yeah. I wanted to work on my pickup skills. And the first two years that I was working on my business, I was going out at least one or two hours a day and talking to people from all walks of life, women, men, uh, everybody, just to be so skillful socially that with communication, I can meet who I want. And if I want to influence somebody, I can do it like this. No yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. Right. And just the people I met through that, forget the business stuff. I have friendships to this day and I've created connections that I otherwise would never have created unless I did that. So basically the answer is go interact with the world. There's a lot of people out there. Start talking to them. Stick your hand out and introduce yourself and you'll see what happens. <laughs> see, that's a great point because if you're just starting out, you don't have to connect with you know the Gary V of the world. You don't need these high-end mentors or nothing. You just need to get around people who are at least going in the same direction so you're not just around your friends who are complaining about their jobs all day, right? Good point. Good point. Yeah, man. We're talking about where the next party is, yeah. you know, living for the weekend. It's like if that's the people that you're right. around, of course, it's going to be difficult for you to see a change or, or, or see this side of the world that we're talking about. Right. You know, like I, I have a rule now. If I ever go on my Facebook and somebody complains about Monday, I just delete them. <laughs> like it's <laughs> why? 
that's not a part of my world. Yeah, and when you yeah. start viewing and having a standard like that for you in your life, then you'll start to see big changes for sure. Very true. Okay, let's keep it fun the last few minutes here. I want to talk about a few things. One is that dating coach side because I have an interesting reference. The other is cars. Sure. But first, sure. you mentioned dating coach and all that. That's part of your world. You mentioned a couple times. Do you, by chance, when you say you know some guys, do you know of RSD? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't associate with them, but uh, I know they're huge on YouTube okay. and all that stuff. Yeah. I was curious if that's the group you're referring to because, funny enough, my uh, my videographer now who works for me here in Toronto used to travel with them with whatever his name is, Tyler or whatever, and they used to go all over the whole. But I, I yeah. saw it. When he was a, like good for good or worse, whatever. But when he was associated with them, his personality, like he was the quietest, shy, like in the dark kid, didn't make new friends, didn't want to go out. After a year of being around that circle, I think it changed his life for the better. Like he's now the la- like he'll talk to anyone, he'll introduce himself to anyone, like men or women. It's not just a pickup mm-hmm. thing. Did that impact your life in the same way? Was that a crucial part? Absolutely, man. And, and that's what people miss is you know there's this label in society. Oh, pickup, you're just trying to sleep with girls, and that's mm-hmm. all fine and dandy. But you know, communication is the quality of your communication is going to determine the quality of your life. That's what I tell people, right? I forget where I heard that, but it's totally true because how many people you know, go out and they want to socialize, but they can't because they, they're scared or whatever it is. So it just improves your quality of life overall. And imagine society, if we all communicated at a much higher level, society would be way better, right? Way better. You know, things would be handled. We wouldn't have all these people getting so sensitive and, and upset over the stupidest little things. Yeah. And as far as the lineage for me, it, it's actually mystery and all those guys. That's the lineage that mm-hmm. I come from, you know, uh, you know, Matador and all those guys, Got you know, it. Neil Strauss and all the people yeah, from yeah. the original game. That's kind of the lineage that I learned from and who I've, you know, hung around with and stuff. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's a great point because at the end of the day, it's a skill. Like you need to have communication, whether in business, whether in life, whether in relationships. And if that's the only place you're going to get it, if, like if you're starting out, you have nothing else and, and that you vibe with that. Getting in that, besides the pickup part, besides getting girls part, you're going to learn a lot of valuable life skills, right? I think one of the big differentiators between successful people and people who are not successful is their ability to communicate, right? You see it all the time. Social dynamics, man. Yeah. Right? How many people do rub us the wrong way because they, yeah. they're not calibrated, right? They, they're, they're too loud in a place that, you know, so it teaches you all those little mm. finite skills that really just overall make you better. And um, even uh, on the dating side, right? Because a lot of people will claim, well, you know, it's very uh, manipulative and you shouldn't be doing that. This is what I tell people, right? If we're going to talk strictly dating, yeah. your, your art form and your skill as a man in the dating field is your communication. Mm-hmm. The woman has her looks initially, right? So if we're going to deem our communication skills as bad or we shouldn't do it, then how come when we go out in the dating world, the woman is allowed to spruce up her hair, Good put point. on makeup, right? Wear stuff to accentuate her breasts, her butt, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. It's the same thing. That's their weapon. Our weapon is our word. Right. And, and, and it's literally that. If we're going to talk about, oh, it gets sensitive about manipulation, look, the word manipulate isn't even bad. If I do this... I just manipulated my glasses by taking them off. Is that bad? No, it's not bad at all. So people need to remove their stigmas and views of these labels right. and look at the science and the information. If you learn how to communicate better and you learn social dynamics, it's going to help you, period. End of story. There's no argument of that. Yeah. And when people would look at it that way, it'll be easier for people to now start looking at social dynamics and say, okay, this is a skill that will actually help me and I'm going to jump in at 100%. Because if we talk sales, mm. people will sign up. But if you say pickup or social dynamics, whoa, whoa, whoa I can't do that, man. That's yeah, kind of yeah, taboo. Yeah. I can't do it. It's the same thing. It is. That That's the funny part. Have you ever noticed really good sales guys are just really good at pickup? It's a weird thing. Because once, you, once yeah. you know how to communicate, it's it's not like there's there's different kinds and whatever, but there's really not. Like communications, like if you can connect with someone, build rapport, and influence a decision, it doesn't matter if it's a deal or if it's sleep with me, right? It's the same thing. Which is interesting. And so I think that's whether you're going to learn pickup or learn sales, I think get around someone who's going to teach you how to communicate (laughs) is the bottom line on that one. 100%. Cool. So I want to talk about something. Your car. You're a big car guy. You have a lot of the dream cars of, I mean, at least my era growing up watching Fast and Furious. You have the Supra I saw. You have the Lamborghini. What else do you have? I have an old Eclipse, which is the nice. same model as uh, you see in the first Fast and Furious, but it's a yeah. GSX, though. It's all-wheel drive. Wow. That's a 97. I have a 2007 Subaru STI. Yeah. So I have a, a Subi. Um, I have the old 
when 50 Cent broke out, the old Escalade from 2003, right? Which is my little gangster car that I roll around in, right? Tinted windows, yeah, big yeah. rims, you know? So that's me reliving my junior year in high school when 50 yeah. Cent came out. And then I have my, uh, I call it my redneck truck, my 2000 uh, Ford it. F-150, that lifted truck, which is... To the average eye, hideous looking, but I love driving it. It has a V8, 5.4 liter V8. It growls. I'm super high off the ground, super comfortable because I'm tall. Mm. So for me to drive the Lambo, yeah. I'm hunched over. And the Escalade in the truck, I can actually sit up straight, and it's just that much more enjoyable to drive. Uh, but I have a couple other cars on my crosshairs, but people will have to stay tuned to, to see nice. what I pick up next. Yeah, it's, it's funny because you, you know a true car guy because like – some people, especially in your area, like in LA and in California, they buy the Lamborghini to play the part. Like I bought a Lambo, I'm cool. But then yeah. you know the guy who's a real car guy because one, you modified everything, <laughs> and two, you come home and hop in a pickup truck or a STI or the Eclipse or the Super. Like yeah. you know, it's a passion. So how did yeah. you choose? Because the Lamborghini Huracan is one of my favorite cars. Like that, that's probably yeah. one of the ones I'd aim at in the next five years. Um, how did you choose that? Like, is that was that always your dream car, Lamborghini? Yeah, I've always wanted to get the Lambo, and my thought process too was I, I want to get a Lambo that I can actually drive because mm. I know a lot of the guys that buy them don't drive them, right? I've already taken mine on two rallies. Nice. I plan on taking it to the track this year because I'm going to get a new set of wheels that are specifically for the track so I can go rip it on the track. Um, so the Lamborghini was always on the wall, but when the Huracan came out, I was like, this is perfect. It's like a daily drivable Lamborghini. Yeah. It looks sick, but I can actually drive it and drive it hard and not have to worry about stuff breaking. Mm. So yeah, I just think it was meant to be because I love the Aventador, but it doesn't drive like the Huracan and it's not as durable. So I wanted to get that, right? And it's funny that you once you get it, bro, you'll see. We still get stupid comments like, oh, you couldn't afford the Aventador, so you get a Huracan. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, everybody has a Huracan. Why'd you get it? It's like, okay, everybody has one. Who? And then they'll name like two YouTubers. Two I'm like, no, 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 no. People you know personally – or that live within a couple miles of you. And they're like, oh, well, nobody. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, where's their Huracan? <laughs> Seriously, bro. I'm like, oh, That's okay, let's, let's go cruise. Because apparently if everybody has one, you have one too, bro. They must have an Aventador in the garage. That's why. Seriously, yeah. They want up me on that one. And then if you got an Aventador, it would be like, why didn't you get the Bugatti or something? Yeah. Oh, you're too broke to afford a LaFerrari, bro. <laughs> Step your game up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I think that holds true to the comments again, where you, that's only the people below you that are going to make those comments. Absolutely, man. I mean, even people that had nicer cars, like, man, congratulations, dude. Yeah. Even when I go to the car shows, all the older cats are like, damn, dude, you have a Lambo already? What are you doing? So it, that only comes from the, the anonymous person sitting in their mom's basement writing to you on YouTube, <laughs> you know, like the old South Park meme where it shows the overweight guy with like eating chips, yeah. <laughs> typing with one hand, you know? The World of Warcraft episode. I remember that episode. That was a good there one. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what it is. But you know what? It's okay because you got it. You love it. You're a true car guy. I can tell. Um, I actually didn't know they were that durable, so that's news to me. That's good. Has it held up to that kind of standard? Absolutely. I mean, there's guys nice. even who have supercharged theirs, and they left everything else stock, and they've driven them 20,000, 30,000 miles in a couple of years, and they're still good to go with just the routine maintenance. So it's not like the old Lamborghinis that would just break down every three days. Yeah, the old Lambos. I know like the Gallardo, you had to change the – I think you had to change the clutch every eight to 10,000 miles, <laughs> and yeah, it was a little bit – different i think the clutch on the huracan will last up until 70 or eighty thousand miles or something like that is is that because of volkswagen's takeover you think i don't know um you know vw actually bought lambo like over 20 years ago oh, I don't okay think people it's been know. a while hmm, I, didn't yeah, know that. I think it was 1997 or 1998 uh but i don't know i just think a lot of it has to do with you know the obviously the improvement of technology and engineering it's just been crazy seeing it and if people haven't watched a documentary about the lamborghini I think they did one of the Aventador and kind of the uh, the whole uh, factory, hmm. you know, in Italy. I recommend they watch it because it's a really cool. It's a really I cool. I haven't watch. seen that. I gotta find. Is it on Netflix? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I know the dude also who started Lamborghini. He originally bought a Ferrari, then he got yes. such poor customer service that he ended up, you know, saying, you know what, I'm gonna make a better car than yours. So that that story was pretty interesting too. Yeah, I gotta watch that. I didn't know. I just googled it now. I'm gonna find it later. That's very cool, man. So what do you say to all these? I mean, cars are, have an interesting place in my heart because when I kind of grew up as a gearhead, my dad was always in it. Yeah. My brother was always in it. Um, but for me, it was, it's always been a symbol. It, it's definitely not like as you get older and you, you see it as for what it is. It's a car. It's it's a toy to have. Yeah. It's fun. It's enjoyable. But when when I was younger, like before I got into the business game, 
that's almost what drew me into business. I was like, I really want that car, and the only people I know that are driving it are in business. So I, I like, I need it, yeah. and I'd just be happy if I had a business and I could buy that car. I'd be, I'd be happy. That's what I used to think, but I don't think that's a bad thing because I think that that helps. Like Andy Frisella talks about it, like how he drives his car around. He goes, you know what? Some little kid's gonna see this at a gas station. He's gonna remember it. He's gonna think about it, and one day that kid's gonna get into business and do something great because he was inspired by that thing. So what do you say to these younger kids or just younger generation in general or just people that don't have one, they want to get their supercar, they want to get a Lamborghini, they have no path to get there, where do they start? Loaded question. Well, uh, you know, it's great to have a goal like that because it, it, it stretches you and you have to have goals like that that push beyond what you believe is conceivable because that's what activates your creative process as a human being to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this thing. From that space of having that goal that's, seems almost unreachable that's when you start literally figuring things out and you all you have to really do is apply what we talked about for the last hour man mm. go out there and, and experience life and eventually you're going to come across something that is, is going to interest you or you're going to say okay i'm going to do this don't just watch oh i'm going to watch all the instagram ads for the guys standing in front of their lambos and i'm going to buy their course that's not the way to do it that's not the way to do it for a year before i found real estate like i said I was going on job interviews. I was hanging out with other friends that I had that were doing entrepreneurial stuff until I found real estate. And I really think you have to go out there and just grab life by the horns and, and see what's going to happen because you can sit behind your computer all day. But until you go out there and interact with the world and people, you're not really going to figure out what moves you, right? It's like uh, Pedge said, you're not going to wake up and suddenly know your life purpose. Oh my God, yeah. I'm going to be a whale watcher, you know, like yeah. it's not just going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, you don't, I think, he can't remember exactly what he said, I gotta go back and listen, but it was something like, you don't find your, per, you don't find your passion, you get passionate about, something. like, the way he worded it was interesting, like, he was just trying to allude to the point that you won't just find it, it doesn't just hit you, you do certain things, you become passionate about certain things, and then they become your passion, that's how it's gonna work. Yeah, right. man, I mean, I can tell people, and I've been very vocal about this, I'm not passionate about real estate. I right. just knew that this was the right vehicle to get me where I wanted to go yes. and create the lifestyle that I wanted, and I saw that in the moment, and that's really what it was. And and when you come across that opportunity, you'll know, yeah. right? But then usually people stop themselves out of fear or, mm -hmm. well, can I do it? If you have that kind of inclination, like I'm not sure, to me, if I'm going to be in your head in that moment, my voice would tell you, this is it, the fact that, you're telling yourself that means go and just start. Yeah. I love it, man. Well, thank you so much. I think there's a ton of value here. I think the moral of the story is if you want to buy a Lamborghini, listen to this podcast, go through the whole episode, <laughs> <laughs> follow all the instructions. Um, but that's great. Where can people find you if they want to connect, if they want to consume your content, list me everything you can. Yeah, man. Uh, at Brian Casella, my full name, B-R-Y-A-N-C-A-S-E-L-L-A -L -L -A for my Twitter, my Instagram. You'll find me on Facebook, uh, YouTube. You just type in Brian Casella. And you'll find me. I'm pretty Googleable now. I like that word, Googleable. <laughs> and what products do you have that can help their lives? Uh, if I was going to recommend one thing to people, it would be my Modern Success Program. You know, a lot of stuff that we talked about here, communication, right? Your mindset, your confidence, all that stuff. I mean, that, that's a really, really comprehensive program that goes well beyond just you know money, real estate, sales. That's my one recommendation to everybody. If I was going to recommend anything, where can they find that? Google. On my website, BrianCasella.com. Perfect. So go to Brian's yep. website, find the program, sign up to it. <laughs> there we go. Good stuff, brother. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. I hope we can do this again. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Thank you, bro. All right, man. Talk soon. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.